Welcome back. We're talking this week to Labor MP Ed Husick, Julian Lisa, the former executive director of the Menzies Research Centre, Miriam Lyons from the Centre for Policy Development, and Liberal MP Josh Frydenberg. I want to turn to the debate over superannuation, which has had a few twists and turns this week. And Ed Husick, we might start with you on this. What do you think? Is there a problem? Is the system unsustainable? Is there a case for tax increases? Well, I mean, as I said yesterday, I think um, you know, a lot of the heat needs to, to get out of the debate and uh, I certainly expressed the view I wanted to wait for the detail uh, before you know, commenting, but I would be you know, uh, really interested in seeing us. Uh, you know, superannuation has been something that Labor has rightly been proud of. It's uh, not only been able to provide people with financial security in the years ahead once they uh, retire, but also to ensure we have a national pool of savings that can be drawn on for investment, so it's played a very critical economic role. Okay, so there's a legacy um, there that you, you don't want to see damaged. Absolutely, rightly, right, rightly be proud of, and you know, we've built on that in terms of increasing the contribution from the 9 to the 12. Again, mm. um, you know, for all those, those benefits with, uh, in particular, a mind to recognising the ageing population that we do have and the fact that people are living longer and need more savings to, mm. to live off. So, so fiddling with it's probably not a good idea. Well, I, again, we need to see the detail. I think there's been a lot of, uh, well, a lot of people Craig, Craig Emerson said uh, on Sky News this afternoon that the, the, the announcement will be made by the budget. Mm. So do you, are you happy with that? I think that's a good development in terms of particularly you know, taking some of the... Uh, as I said, it seemed to have got a momentum of its own and to be able to give people some certainty and some... Uh, uh, appreciation of what exactly will be done, I think, is a good thing. Miriam, what, what do you think about this issue? Uh, and you know, perhaps we should explain where the tax benefits really are in superannuation, because yeah. the higher incomes earners do have uh, a, a bigger benefit to put yeah. money into superannuation. Yeah. Yeah. So the top 10% of income earners get about 30% of the benefit from the current super tax breaks, mm. um, which is pretty unfair any way you look at it. Basically, you, I don't think that you can object to any idea of winding those tax concessions back unless you're against the idea of a progressive tax system in general and you just want to have a sort in, of flat tax like should, Estonia should or like though, the one Joe Bianchi Peterson wanted. Yeah, you know? those high income earners can only put 25000 into super. There's a, there's a limit on how much of this benefit they can enjoy. That's right, but to be able to have a spare 25,000 lying around to put into super mm. and then but to, get, like a very dis in but a, but to get a rate. very disproportionate benefit in return for that extra contribution, I think is very strange. I, mean, uh, I, I quite liked Alan Kohler's idea, which is, OK, sure, we should be incentivising super contributions above the compulsory 9%, because the 9% is compulsory. Why would you need to incentivise it? That's just a waste of money and a waste mm -hmm. of, you know, uh, of of the potential to actually create a good incentive. So why not have a discount on everybody's existing progressive tax rate? Um, that would so be a much fairer okay, way of so doing it. So instead of the current system, maybe have whatever it is, 10 or 15% tax concession on your super contributions, regardless of what you earn. Um, to, to have a discount on what yeah. the tax on, rate is. On your marginal is. tax so, rate, yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I would actually say that, you know, maybe even that doesn't go too far. When you look at super, you know, it's the magic of compound interest, right? You know, whatever you put in, whatever inequality in what people are able to afford to put into their super balance, that compounds over time. So it leads to a much greater inequality of potential retirement income. And, and the way that the system has been working at the moment, it's really ineffective in cost terms. It's, it's going to cost, the, those tax concessions are going to cost us more than the age pension currently does within about four years. So it's not saving us money. It's not fair. Um, I would actually, I kind of hope, you know, here's a challenge to you guys. Uh, unfortunately, you know, uh, this is a really good idea um, which has been announced with no detail uh, and not with a particularly well, it, it good sales announced. pitch, yes, which, which is, is which, which, problem, which is which is really familiar uh, of a way of uh, Labor kind of bungling the introduction yeah. of a good idea, yeah, Julian, you know, letting everybody else pull it apart. But I think they should actually go hard. You know, don't don't um, mess around with you know maybe reducing you know from reducing the rate at which a higher tax rate kicks in from say three hundred thousand down to I don't know one eighty thousand. You know, why not at least let the top five income. Uh, five percent of income people earners. need to have certainty in in the system if they're going to plan for their retirements and there have been people who've been making investment choices in relation to superannuation on the but basis of the pre existing system their existing super and is not going to be touched. anybody who can afford to put twenty five thousand aside whether they're people on two hundred and fifty thousand whatever they're in they're, they're exactly the sort of people you want to encourage 
to save for their retirement because those sorts of people should not be dependent on the state because they've decided to... Those to sorts of people sort of are going to be saving for their but, retirement uh, anyway. But uh, if you've set up a government-sponsored regime for them to actually save money uh, and a government investment vehicle, which is essentially what uh, tax concession superannuation is, then you need to have certainty so they can make their investments So in, at the moment, that, we, we spend $1 of public money for every 10 cents that we save on the age pension. Does that sound very there, effective there are, there as a way of getting those there, people there are off massive the age problems pension? in the super system. And at the other end, you've got the whole issue of moral hazard. I mean, there are people who think that uh, she'll be right, you know, could just, I'll, I'll just look after, just put my money away in the super and I'll have enough to retire on. And that's not going to be true for a lot of people. Some people will end up blowing their money and will end up having a whole bunch of people back on the pension at any rate. We should a whole lot of, uh, I mean, at the end of the day, I, I'd prefer to listen to Simon Crean and Martin Ferguson on this issue. Stop the class warfare. I mean, people are being targeted because they're, they're saving for their future. It's because they're going to reduce their dependency on the state going forward. We do have an ageing population. 13% of the population today is over the age of 65. It doubles by 2050 to 26%. We need to prepare for that. And one the way is... When, when is the idea of extending a progressive tax system so that it covers super class warfare? It's a good tax outcome, isn't it? No, this is a desperate tax grab by the government. At the end of the day, they're facing a $20 billion surplus. Mm. Uh, sorry, they wish, a $20 billion <laughs> deficit after the uh, Treasurer told us 300 times we're going to get a surplus. They've got $145 billion of debt and they need to find money somewhere. And so they're going to superannuation. And, you know, it's not just Labor and a few, uh, a few Labor ministers or former ministers in the Liberal Party who are saying don't touch this. It's the business community. It's academics. It's people who are sitting on the t Henry Tax Review. I mean, this has received criticism right across the board and Bill Shorten, who's the Minister for Superannuation, is in a witness protection scheme. He hasn't said anything well, because he knows, he knows I, I how, agree. how dangerous It would be great to hear more detail. Just once it would be lovely to have, um, instead of a, a, a vague idea of a policy and then we'll back down from even the idea of it, it would be nice to have an actual concrete policy well, decided announced, what to do. That's, that's pretty um, and an ambitious one um, and, uh, and uh, you know, a, a well thought through way of actually communicating what that means to people so that they understand they understand that existing super balances will not be touched. So there's plenty of certainty there. But can I just say class warfare, if that's class warfare, what is the decision by the coalition that they're going to abolish the um, change oh, that the, 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 the Labor that? government makes? No, 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 they're going to reinstate that 15% tax system for the people who are less than 37,000 dollars. Miriam, let me explain that. Um, firstly, when John Howard left office, the co-contributions for low-income earners were $1,500. This government has cut it to $500. So they're no friend of the low-income earners. Secondly, this tax offset, which you refer to, is funded by the mining tax revenue. The $2 billion that was supposed to flow annually from the mining tax. We've shown what a fast that is. So well orchestrated, there's not producing any So revenue. to satisfy your so political we point, no, no. 3.6 so million low-income earners no, lose $500 the, Ed, each. At the end of the day, we've got, to, we've got to actually have a responsible approach to fiscal management. And the and responsible that's what this approach is about. does no, no, not include you, 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 a second. responsible approach to fiscal management. So every time we propose, you guys say you need to cut spending. And every time we go to cut spending, you oppose that. If we go to make the spending fairer... Oh, well, let's talk about that. You want to cut $15,000 through the course of a, a student's education. You talk on the one hand about cost of living, but then you want to make it harder for parents dealing with the cost of living that are being supported but through the school you kids' you've got to pay bonus. for this stuff. You've got the money to pay for <laughs> this sort of stuff. You've got the bond scheme, you've the point I'm making us, the, the, buy a few submarines here. What else are you going to that, pay for? Uh, the, well, well, actually, I want to come to that point about defence, because I know you've actually banged on about the fact that... Let's uh, try and get back to superannuation. Somehow we've ended up But the point I make, well, the issue on defence is, I mean, I've heard Josh go on about how terrible the defence cuts are and these guys won't actually reinstate well, them. Yeah, on okay. fiscal management, but fiscal responsibility, hang on a second, let me make, make the point. Um, every time we've gone to actually make saves, they've opposed them. On issues like this, where they, um, uh, in terms of superannuation, they have said that any change we do make, they won't change them. They want to be able to have, you know, eat, you know, have their cake and eat it too. OK, but just on the low income earners. Uh, you say there that because this is funded by the mining tax, you guys can't afford it, the low income earners will lose that benefit. <clears throat> but you are keeping some other elements that are funded by the mining tax. Particularly? 
the increase in the super mm -hmm. guarantee from 9 to 12 per cent. Yeah, but at the end of the day, we've made a decision that we want to bring the budget back to surplus and we're going to pay back the $145 billion of debt. And contrary to what Ed said, we've named a number of areas we're going to have savings where you're not prepared to follow us, like in terms of public servants and like in terms of the school kids bonus and elsewhere. So at the end of the day, we've said that we will not fund um, these, this tax offset by... Are you uh, going to reinstate the co-contribution if you're against apply, it being Well, does cut? the same apply then to getting rid of the carbon tax and what it funds? Well, we've said on, in terms of the carbon tax, we're hoping to get rid of the carbon tax and to leave the situation as it is. We're so hoping. You're you fairly definite, weren't you, previously? You said this is well, rock solid. The, well, that, the, sort of like the stop the boats I promise mean, the, with the, the asterisks end of, at the, the end of it. Yeah, well, at the end of the day, if you get rid of the carbon tax, you're going to help reduce people's electricity and power bills okay, and the cost the, of living. <laughs> just, just, just so at clear, the end of the day, you know, please. just to be clear, we're though, actually reducing if, if, taxes grows the economy. And that's what we're If you get do. rid of the carbon tax, the tax cuts that are linked to it stay? Well, that is, that is our intention, and Tony Abbott has said that. Hang on a second. You said reducing taxes grows the economy. So why didn't you ever support us on the reduction of the corporate tax rate? We have supported a reduction no, of the corporate tax rate. No, you didn't. We you absolutely You have. stopped us from being okay, able to... Well, just, just getting back to my question here. You get rid of the carbon tax, but keep the benefits that are associated with it. You get rid of the mining tax, but you can't afford to keep the... Some well, of the there are, associated at with. the end of the day, it's not a magic pudding. I mean, this is Labor's problem. But it is on the carbon tax. But you it, just it, said it, you'll keep the tax cuts. Because, I mean, we're, we're, we've actually got to make some tough decisions. And, yeah. we've, and, and, we've, look, take, and we've taken that carbon tax is raising tens on the tax of billions of dollars, right? And you, so you're going to not have that. Well, we're actually but you'll gonna... still find from the magic pudding money to keep the tax cuts well, in we, place. Well, you've actually had to make some very having tough having the magic decisions. pudding and keeping it too. No, well, actually, when we were in government, we, we produced budget surpluses. When you've been in government, you've produced the four biggest budget deficits in the history of the yeah, Commonwealth, with the fifth GFC on the way, out. and you haven't produced a, bu a budget surplus for 11 years. Can so I just say, it's the it's way a that a bunch of the European countries and the United States got themselves into the position that they're in now is that they were unwilling to actually pay the kind of taxes that would allow them to have the kind of public services and the level of service that everybody agreed that they want. Mm. So, so we're kind of having the wrong debate here. You know, are we actually willing to pay the price of living in a first world country, living with a kind of welfare state, with a kind of public services that most Australians but Mary, expect. How much, how much do high income earners, um, you know, I'm not here defending high income earners, but how much tax do they have to pay? Because you look at the, the, ta the total tax take at the moment and a great percentage of it is coming from high income earners. A lot is being redistributed to lower income earners already. Yes, it is. And that's part of why, that's, you know, part of the deal with having a progressive income tax system. Mm. And if you don't like the idea that high income but earners are going point, to be paying more point, as a proportion of, these, of their income, uh, then you can go with the Joe B. L. Peterson idea. You can go mm. like Estonia and have a flat tax. But at what point do some of these high income earners, this, this, this town pool, uh, you know, for want of a better word, in, in a lot of their cases, say, OK, I've had enough. And you have a brain drain and they go elsewhere. And a lot of Australians do that too. I mean, there are lots of people in our generation who've chosen to go overseas to work because of the economic benefits Australia, and lower Australia tax rates. Australia is, is lots one of, of the people in Asia and the Middle East who are working precisely. Let's just be realistic. That's a bit of a stretch. Are There's, you saying Australia that people are leaving? Australia up there with Switzerland in terms of the level of income and our quality of life. Yeah. We are. A, are an absolutely exceptional country in the world at the moment in terms of the quality of life you can have here. I don't think we're going to see a mass exodus because, you know, the superannuation you know, tax rate you know, there, there on a compulsory a, super a, contribution a global, gets tweaked a little bit. There's a, there's a global war for talent going on yeah, that's and, true. Uh, and, and different countries' tax rates play a, play a part in that. Uh, and but you I know think why it's interesting. we've done fairly well so far? I think it's interesting how we got to this whole issue of superannuation in the first place. The, the, the pre-budget cabinet leak is as time-honoured a tradition as the Federation itself. And yet, I don't know why, of all issues, the government would choose to leak this particular issue, given that it's caused such pain in the community, such anguish, and then have to come and kind of stamp out the leak. The usual thing budget leaks are used for is put out a bit of good news, maybe test something that has some detail on it, and if it's completely bad, you get rid of it. It's but superannuation. This is very effect, strange it's been policy handled, hasn't it, to, uh, no. to leak. Uh, How would you we'll, characterize uh, the handling of this issue? Uh, I think uh, there'll be all sorts of people that will characterise it in all sorts How of ways. How would you characterise it? No, well, I'm, I actually welcome the fact that we've said, you know, we've come out in terms of saying today that we'll be providing that detail before the budget and that we do need to provide that level of, as I said earlier, because it's tonight, been, it's been a shambles level of certainty. Up, up so, no, well, it's become a feeding frenzy of its own. And as I said, uh, uh, I've always, you know, I took the view and I said that publicly, you know, I'd prepare to be more comfortable seeing the detail. 
um, but would also be concerned that we you know, preserve the integrity of the system. All right. Speaking of the global talent pool, we're going to take a break and come back and look at 457 visas and whether there's hypocrisy on the part of some on this.